A 10-year-old boy in the Solomon Islands gives up video games to plant a church. A young girl in Brazil gives up her birthday cake to feed the homeless. And a modern-day miracle in India. All that and much more coming up next. Hello and welcome to Mission 360, coming to you today from San Francisco in California in the United States. Around the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, there were several urban centres of influence operating right here in San Francisco. So many in fact that Ellen White referred to this city as a beehive, it was a beehive of mission activity. Behind me you can see the location for the Adventist Church and a school at the time. And there was a vision to start a center of influence in the basement of the church. And the vision was for it to be a clinic, treatment rooms, basically to help the poor and the homeless in the area. There were many, many Adventists who sacrificed and donated money for this project. But among them was a group of young people, a self-denial society, who put their coins together so that they could help this center. And the Pacific Union recorder at the time recorded this. It said, The young people of San Francisco and Oakland have voted to establish a self-denial fund to take the money that young people so often spend for candy, chewing gum, ice cream, and other things more or less harmful to health, and with this money create a self-denial fund to help in the establishment of the dispensary who will join us in this grand work? What a wonderful project and what a wonderful thing that children and young people were involved in mission back then. And today they are also involved in mission in very, very practical ways. First up, we're going to travel to the Solomon Islands to visit a young boy who's given up something so that he can start a new group of believers. Ten-year-old Joe watched movies and played video games with friends at his home in the Solomon Islands, but he wasn't happy. Joe's family lived in a poor neighborhood in the South Pacific country's capital, Honiara. Neighbors sold illegal drugs, and children stole and got into trouble with the police. Joe's house was a popular place for neighborhood boys to hang out every evening. He noticed that one of his friends didn't talk like the other boys and participated in something called a Pathfinder Club every Sabbath. Joe decided to join his friend at the Seventh-day Adventist Church to learn more. Soon, he joined the Pathfinders as well and went to church every Sabbath. After a while, Joe and the other Pathfinders were invited to fly to Australia to attend a campery for Pathfinders from all over the South Pacific Division. He really wanted to go, so Mom worked hard to save money for his plane ticket. When Mom was finally able to buy his ticket, Joe flew to the campery and enjoyed every second of it. When Joe returned home and the neighborhood boys came over that evening, he told stories from the campery. The boys loved the stories, so they asked to hear more the next evening. Then Joe thought to himself, My friends like to hear about Pathfinders. Why not tell them about Jesus, too? So each evening when his friends came over, Joe kept telling them stories from the Pathfinder Campery, but also began to share stories from the Bible. Joe's friends enjoyed his stories so much that they invited other boys from the neighborhood to come hear them too. Soon, 30 to 40 boys came to Joe's house every evening to learn more about Jesus. Although mom didn't have much money, she began to cook food for the children to eat after story time. She somehow always had enough food for everyone. Joe's new friends began to ask him if they could join Pathfinders, and four joined him at church the next Sabbath. More of his friends came to church the following week. The Pathfinder leader couldn't understand where all these children were coming from. Joe, why are so many kids from your neighborhood coming to Pathfinder Club? He asked. What did you do? I didn't do anything, Joe replied. I just tell them stories about what we did in Australia, and we have evening devotions, that's all. The leader asked to visit Joe's home to see the evening get-togethers for himself. When he came that evening, he was amazed at what he saw. 
Afterward, he said to mom, this neighborhood would be a good place to open a church. He noticed that Joe's house had a large unfinished living room that no one used and asked if it could be used for Sabbath worship. Mom agreed. Several dozen neighborhood children came to Joe's house for church the next Sabbath. All the Pathfinder leaders and their families came as well, and they brought food for everyone. Then something happened that made Joe very happy. Mom decided to be baptized. Not long after, his 20-year-old cousin was baptized too, and so were three of his neighborhood friends whom Joe had introduced to Pathfinders. Today, Joe's living room is packed every Sabbath with about 70 people, and plans are underway to open a permanent church in the neighborhood. Now, Joe is 13 years old. He's humble in appearance and speech, but no one doubts that God is using him in a powerful way. I may be small, but in God's hand, I can grow a church. Like Joe, you too can help grow God's church as you share Jesus with your friends and family. My guest here in San Francisco is Cindy Chamberlain, and she's the Vice President for Communication for the Central California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. That's a mouthful. Thanks for joining us, Cindy. Sure. Uh, what, what is the role of a VP for communication? Well, I think the better question would be, what isn't the role of a okay. VP for communication? <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a smaller answer, shorter answer? <laughs> shorter answer. Yeah. In, a, in a nutshell, I protect the conference's image the, with litigation matters. I also do PR, uh, plan our beloved SoCal camp meeting, which is uh, 10 days of live programming, and also communicate to the local churches and pastors and the people within our beautiful territory. Wonderful. And in your spare time? There is no spare time. Can you describe for our viewers uh, the, the Central California Conference? What, what does it look like? What sort of territory does it um, cover? Well, that's a really great question. Thank you. And uh, I think we probably live in one of the most diverse uh, conferences in, in California. We have uh, the coastal areas such as Santa Cruz, San Luis Obispo, beautiful coastal resort towns, uh, destinations of America, really. We also have San Francisco, which is one of the uh, most secular cities in the world. And then we have Bakersfield, which is farmland and uh, agricultural. Then we have um, other areas that are very rural, such as uh, Sonora. And then we have a, a very high traffic Silicon Valley, San Jose areas. So we have a huge diversity of race and culture. Even among Adventism, we have, we have the full spectrum there. So much of your territory is heavily urbanized, like the Bay Area. Yes. And I noticed that your vision statement states reflecting Christ, transforming communities. What is being done to help transform communities here? Approximately once a month, sometimes more, Central organizes through Dr. Urbina and the Life Hope Centers a clinic whereby they take the clinic out and they take and go to the people directly and just service their needs. We don't ask any questions, we don't preach, we just service their needs. We also have available an array of material for the whole health package, that being spiritual, mental, physical, and a vast array of many other health services for the taking. But we don't push that. We are simply there just to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Wonderful. Can you tell me a story of someone whose life has been touched through this ministry? Yes, I can. Um, one story is about a, a girl in Hollister. Her name was Delilah, and Delilah came to the clinic, and she needed service. I believe it was on her teeth and she received the services. She had a little smidgen of Adventism, but she was not active at all, and uh, she just needed the services. She was so impressed, she's a young girl, so impressed by that. She decided in her mind to become a dental assistant hmm. to, to, to make that career trajectory. So she went, she enrolled in classes in that, and the next year when a Life Hope Center uh, teams arrived. They found there was Delilah. She was this time a volunteer 
and she had also brought her whole dental class. Oh wow! So what we <laughs> what we see is when we go to help, it comes back in dividends because suddenly we they've joined our team, and now she's a, a huge advocate for what we do. Cindy, thanks so much for sharing with us those stories and what's happening here in Central Cal, and may God bless you. Thank you. And viewers at home, it's just wonderful when Christ's method of ministry is put into practice, there are results. People are healed, not only physically, but also spiritually. We'll be right back right after this break. Welcome back to San Francisco. And behind me, you can see the iconic Golden Gate Bridge. Next up, we travel to Chiang Mai, Thailand to hear Karen's story of a modern day miracle. Hey kids, I was wondering, have you ever wondered if God still does miracles like he used to in Bible times? Does he, does he heal people like he used to? Well, I used to wonder that too. I went to India to do some evangelism and I was sitting in the airport waiting to come back. We had had an amazing experience where at every evangelism site, about 525 people had been baptized, 500, somewhere around there at each site. And it had been absolutely an amazing experience. But I'm sitting in the airport and I am really sleepy. I am tired and I'm afraid. My flight doesn't leave for a long time. I'm afraid I'm gonna to go to sleep and miss my flight. So I looked around to see if anybody there might look like they might speak English and might want to talk. Well, I saw a gentleman sitting there with red hair and blue eyes, and I said, maybe he speaks English. And so I went over there, and he told me an amazing story that I want to tell you today. He was a pastor from Australia, and he told me that the first time he went to India, he was preaching every night, and hundreds and hundreds of people were coming. And as they came every night to learn about Jesus, they had several baptisms. They would go down to the river and they would baptize people and it was going fantastic. But the last night he was picking up his computer and his projector was getting ready to put it away. All the people had gone away when somebody stepped up on the stage and he heard the words, pastor, pastor. The only words this man knew in English, he turned around and he went, oh, now, usually you're not supposed to gasp when you look at somebody, right? But this man looked terrible. He was a leper. He had leprosy. Have you heard of leprosy from the Bible? Yeah. Well, he had leprosy and his nose had rotted off and fallen off his face and he had a big hole where his cheek used to be. You could see his teeth moving up and down when he talked. He also didn't have any fingers or toes. They had rotted and fell off of his, fallen off of his body and he smelled terrible. But with the help of the translator, he said to the pastor, he says, Pastor, would you please pray for me? I've been coming every night and I sat behind that tree over there listening to the most wonderful news I have ever heard in my life about a Jesus that loves me. Yes, me, even me, a leper. And I would like to ask you to pray to God for three things. Number one, that God would heal my fingers. Because you see, I want a Bible. And if God would heal my fingers, I would be able to turn the pages of the Bible and that God would give me a Bible and that God would teach me how to read. And the pastor said, wow, I don't think I've ever prayed for a leper before. I'm not sure what to expect, but okay. So he prayed for this man and you know what? When he opened his eyes, the man looked exactly the same and the pastor felt really guilty. And the devil whispered in the pastor's ear, you know how sometimes we're tempted? And the devil said to him, huh, you're the only Christian he knows. The Bible says that if you had as much faith as a little tiny mustard seed, you could tell that mountain over there to move and it would move. You're the first Christian he's ever met and you don't have enough faith to heal him. <gasps> well, first of all, children, we never heal anybody, do we? That would be Jesus's job, right? But the pastor felt so bad. Maybe he didn't have enough faith. Oh dear. But he said to the man, can I take your picture? I'll print it out and look at it every day to pray for you. The man said, yes. So he took the man's picture. He went home to Australia. He printed it out, put it on the refrigerator door with some magnets. And every day when he got his milk out for his breakfast, he would see that face looking back at him and he would pray for him. 
Finally, two years went by and the pastor had a chance to go back to India again to do evangelism again. And he wanted to see the people that he had baptized the time before, but he was going to be a hundred kilometers away from where he had been the time before. And he was afraid if he told him he was coming, maybe he wouldn't have enough time to go see them. So he thought, I'm not going to tell him. I'm just going to show up as a surprise when I get some free time. And so he decided to do exactly that. So he got on the airplane, he went to India, he preached a meeting, but you know what? There was even more people at that meeting than there had ever been at the other meeting. And so he didn't have enough time to go see the first village because it was about 100 kilometers. That's quite a ways. So the last night he's putting away his stuff again inside this huge tent that they had pitched. And he was putting stuff away when he heard somebody running from outside. He thought, that's strange. I wonder who's here. And before he could turn around, somebody gave him a big sweaty hug. That really surprised him because in India, in that section of India, nobody hugs anybody. So he was very surprised that he got a hug. He turned around and he said, uh, hi. And the man said, oh, pastor, pastor. He called over his translator. Do you remember me? He looked at the man and he said, no, I've never seen you before. Oh, pastor, look at my eyes. Do you remember me? Pastor said, you know, it's very strange. I do recognize your eyes, but not your face. I don't know why, I'm, I'm so sorry. The man says, but pastor, I'm the leper. And the pastor knew he was telling him the truth because those were the same eyes that looked at him from the refrigerator door every day. He said, oh my, what happened? He said, well, I went back to my village and when I went back to my village, I told them about Jesus. And I told them about Jesus every single night for a whole week, for about an hour every night. And then I ran out of stuff to say. I couldn't remember anything else. And so somebody said, can't you remember anything else? He said, no. Well, where could you find out more about this Jesus? He said, well, if somebody would buy me a Bible, that's God's book. I could read you lots more stories and tell you a lot more things about Jesus, but I don't have any money. And somebody said, really, how are you going to read? And he say, they said, you don't go to school. None of us have gone to school in this little village. We don't know how to read. He said, but the God of heaven is all powerful and he will teach me how to read. So if you will buy me a Bible, I will read it to you. Really, said a lady. Well, if this God is so powerful, how's come you still have leprosy? Hmm. He didn't know what to say. He thought about it and he said, oh, because you see, it's not essential that I be healed but it's essential that you know about Jesus. So if you get me a Bible, I will learn how to read because the God of heaven is gonna teach me. Little old man said, okay. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to the big city tomorrow. I'm gonna take all my life savings and I'm going to buy a Bible. I sure hope you know how to read. So he did. He went to the big city. It took him all day to find a Bible. They wanted to sell him a Quran and other important religious books but that are not Bibles and they don't tell us that much about Jesus and so finally he found a Bible he brought it back the little leper was waiting for him he gave him the Bible and he said I sure hope you can read well the little leper had seen street signs you know how you see street signs that says the name of the street but he didn't know what those letters meant he opened the Bible he says pastor you know where it opened to it's now my favorite text I don't know but it's the first time I ever read it it said for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever pastor includes people like me. And he says, I don't know how I could read. I just could. And he said the little old man got so excited he ran through the village yelling, he can read, he can read. And he woke up people and they came out. And he says, I read to them for about an hour. We started in Genesis and I read them about creation. And pastor, we've read every night for about an hour. We've read through the Bible more than once. And the other day we heard that the red haired pastor was back. So I was wondering pastor, if you would baptize us. Us, said the pastor. He said, yes, pastor, as I kept reading the Bible, my nose grew back, my cheek filled in, my fingers came back, I don't know how, but I went to see a doctor and he said that I'm no longer a leper. And he couldn't believe it because none of his gods have ever done anything like that for him before. And I told him it's because the God of heaven is of course the greatest God and that's why he is the only true God and that's why I was healed. And so pastor, we've been reading every night and 
There's 25 people outside the tent, Pastor, that want to get baptized. We've been walking day and night to get here. Would you baptize us? And that night, boys and girls, that previous leper and 25 people from his village got baptized because the God of heaven hasn't changed a bit since Bible times. God can do the same through you. Don't ever say you're too young. Well, we're still in San Francisco and behind me here, you can see these California sea lions. Well, you can see them, you can possibly hear them, but lucky for you, you can't smell them. Well, next up, we're traveling to Brazil and we're gonna meet Juliana who gave up her birthday cake so that she could help feed the homeless in her city. Mom didn't expect Juliana to refuse a cake for her 11th birthday. I want to bake you a chocolate cake, Mom said a few days before Juliana's birthday. No, thank you, Juliana said. Mom looked surprised. Why not, she said. I want to feed the homeless people rather than have a cake, Juliana said. Let's make soup for the homeless. Juliana had seen a crowd of homeless people sleeping at the bus stop when she and Mom had gone out, and she couldn't stop thinking about them. It's too difficult and too much work, Mom said. It would cost too much money for the ingredients. We also don't have a big pot to cook enough soup. But Juliana wasn't discouraged. I want to give soup to the homeless, she insisted. This is the work of God. Juliana had learned about God at a Seventh-day Adventist church in Salvador, Brazil. She first went to the church because she wanted to join its Pathfinder Club. She had seen a neighborhood friend wearing the Pathfinder uniform, so she wanted to be a Pathfinder too. A little while after she joined the club, she gave her heart to Jesus and was baptized. Mom was glad that Juliana loved God, but she wasn't interested in going to church. After Mom said she couldn't cook soup without a big pot, Juliana visited some of her Adventist neighbors and asked if they had a big pot that she could borrow. Two neighbors gave her big pots and she brought them home three days before her birthday. But she still didn't have the ingredients for the soup. The matter seemed hopeless, so Juliana prayed. God, please give me wisdom and touch mom's heart to allow me to make soup for the homeless. The next day, Juliana gingerly asked mom again whether she could make soup for the homeless. Mom got angry. Go to the store and ask for them to donate the food for the soup, she replied. She secretly hoped that Juliana would be too shy to go to the store. But Juliana happily skipped to the neighborhood store praying, thank you God for answering my prayer. At the store, she told the manager about her desire to make soup for the homeless and asked if he would donate the ingredients. He told her to return the next day. Juliana went to several other stores with the same request, but all the managers also told her to return the next day. She visited her Adventist neighbors again, and they promised to bring over some vegetables. The day before Juliana's birthday, she stopped at the first grocery store after school. The manager gave her a huge bag of vegetables. The other stores and her Adventist neighbors also gave her food as they said they would. Mom was shocked when she saw bags of onions, chili peppers, potatoes, carrots, pumpkins, corn, spices, and other ingredients for soup. What is all this? She asked. These are the ingredients for the soup that you're going to make, Juliana beamed and showed Mom the two big pots that she had borrowed. Mom was amazed at Juliana's determination to help the homeless. With the help of several Adventist women, they made the soup. On her birthday, Juliana put on her Pathfinder uniform, and with her friends and mom, they loaded the two big pots of soup into a car. When they arrived at a bus stop where some homeless people sat, a friend announced, today is Juliana's birthday, and she has made soup for you. The homeless people were delighted. Everyone formed a circle around Juliana and clapped and sang happy birthday to her. Mom felt ashamed that she hadn't wanted to help the homeless. She realized that Juliana was filled with the love of God, and she wanted to be filled with God's love too. Two months after Juliana's birthday, Mom was baptized. Today, Juliana, Mom, and several other church members go out twice a month to feed the homeless and share God's blessings. You can give to this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering. 
part of which will help open a place in Juliana City, Salvador, Brazil, where people can take Bible studies and healthy cooking classes. Think about ways that you too can help people in need in your community. Thank you for your mission offering. Well, that's just about it for today's program, and thanks so much for joining us. It's just so encouraging to see young kids involved in mission. I, I love the story of the, the girl in Brazil and that little boy in the Solomon Islands. What an amazing thing. It was just so natural to him to share his faith and start a new group of believers. Well, I want to thank you for being a part of Adventist Mission. I want to thank you for the way that you support through your prayers, your offerings, and also through your personal involvement. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krauss, and I hope that next time you can join me right here on Mission 360.